Region Europe is the international program of the University of Turin, pursuing a comprehensive knowledge of the European model of regional integration and of the EU as a global actor. The involvement of 45 guest lecturers coming from all across the world's most prestigious universities and institutions allows us to bring fresh and critical perspectives on crucial issues concerning European integration and the role of the EU in world affairs with a forward-looking approach. We want to introduce you to how the EU actually works from its beating heart, visiting its institutions and interacting with its actors. From its first edition, each year Region Europe has given the opportunity to more than 150 students coming from all over the world to gather and exchange views and experiences. Thank you very much. So I've, I've been introduced, so thank you very much. Um, so I won't um, add much to the introduction, except to say I'm actually, I've actually been in Brussels now for more than 14 years. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, Brussels is one of those places when you first go, you think you'll only spend a year and you end up spending <laughs> more than a decade. Um, it's my real pleasure to be here and a, a very huge thanks uh, um, to all of you for participating in, in this session. What I'm going to be doing is um, I'm going to share, shortly be sharing my screen um, and I will be sharing some slides to start with. But uh, I will share the slides at the beginning and then I'll stop and then speak a bit more. And then I will uh, make sure we have ample time for discussion. So, um, and because I'm very also keen to hear your, your questions, but I would like to ask you all as well, please to hold your questions until the end, um, as it will be quite difficult for me to, to manage the chat while I'm also um, presenting to you. Um, and then I'm just really looking forward to, to interaction and, and to hearing also uh, what it is you, you're interested in, in learning. So I'm gonna start now by sharing my screen and thank you those who you, you put on your video. It's lovely to see you. I understand it's a bit difficult sometimes with the video, maybe after the presentation, if others are, are uh, able to put the video, um, please do so. But I also understand if it's not possible um, according to your uh, internet. So what I want to talk to you about today is about civil society power. So our power and our engagement with EU and development policy, and that's really going to be um, the focus um, in, in terms of development policy and, and international cooperation. And I want to just give you an overview of, of how I'm going to structure the talk. I want to start just by explaining a little bit more about Care International and Concord Europe. We already had a, a very brief mention of them, but I think it will help you to understand what it is we're, we're trying to do at EU level, if you understand a little bit more about the organizations. Then I want to explain how what it is we seek to influence um, and how civil society influences, and then look at some of the powers and uh, sorry, some of the opportunities and challenges that CSO has um, in terms of their, their power. And finally, I uh, reach a conclusion. Now, I'm going to start, as I said, with a very brief introduction to Care International and Concord. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm the director of Care International in Brussels, and it's a global confederation of 14 members with six candidates and affiliates. Um, and what does that mean? I mean, essentially, it's 20 organizations, but we work in over 100 countries. Um, we're a dual mandate organization. That means we work on both humanitarian and development um, cooperation. And as I said, working in over 100 countries with the mission to save lives, to defeat poverty, achieve social justice and inclusion. And we have a very specific focus on women and girls. And the organization, in fact, um, 
is 75 years old and was um, founded um, right after um, the war in 1945, initially by some American and Canadian um, associations who um, who organized themselves to bring care packages, so-called care packages, to Europe um, to help um, the people to recover after the war. And, um, and, and since then, the membership uh, of the organization grew. And in Europe, in fact, we have, we have nine members and presence in 12 European countries. Um, so members like Care France, Care Germany, Care Netherlands, Care Austria, uh, Care Denmark and Norway, Care Czech Republic, Care Luxembourg, I'm sure I've made some Care UK. Um, we don't yet have uh, Care Italy, but who knows, maybe one day we will. Um, but also in terms of the global members, we have Care India, Care Peru, Care Thailand, um, and some of our candidates include a, a, a potential member in Indonesia, in Caucasus, in Egypt. Um, so it's it's yes, very much a global organization. And my role, as I said, is to direct the Brussels office, which is very specifically um, working to influence EU policy and specifically development and humanitarian policy. Now, what are what we do as an organization? Uh, it's a big organization. As I said, we focus on gender equality throughout everything we do, but we also work in different thematic areas, food, nutrition, and water systems, women's economic justice. So that's really about helping women to, um, to, 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 to create uh, economic opportunities and, and what we call financial inclusion to make sure that they're included in, in access to finance and access to decent jobs. Um, and also, uh, as I've mentioned before, humanitarian aid is a huge part of what we do. We also work on health equity and rights. And, and the reason we talk about rights uh, related to health is that health is a right, but also when we look at rights, we also have a specific focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights within the health sector, um, which is very much um, an issue that um, includes a, a rights dimension. And climate justice um, is, is the other area we're working on. So addressing climate change, but also, again, very much from a justice and rights angle. Now, I also have a role in Concord, and my role in Concord, as mentioned previously, I'm vice president of the board. And I was elected in this position um, as also a Care International is a member of Concord. Concord is the European Confederation of Relief and Development NGOs, and we represent over 2,600 NGOs across Europe. So, um, each, each European member state has a, Europe, has a, has a, an NGO, a development NGO platform, which is a member of Concord, but Concord also includes uh, as members, the, the kind of the big, um, what we call um, network NGOs, such as CARE or um, Save the Children or Oxfam. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of, of, of platforms and, and networks. And we are, in fact, the main interlocutor with EU institutions on development policy. That means when, when the EU wants to talk to development NGOs, they come to Concord. Um, and as a confederation, we work together to ensure that European policies promote sustainable economic, social and human development. So that EU policies are addressing the causes of poverty, that they're based on a human rights approach that they address gender equality, justice, and democracy. And I'm going to talk a bit more about the content uh, a bit later. But just to say that we have some priority areas as Concord, and the main pillars, the priorities are to address inequalities and building a sustainable economy. And here, uh, again, I'll talk a bit more about that later, but to say we're really looking at um, transformation in the economic system. Uh, the second area is policy coherence for sustainable development. And that's a bit of um, 
of a jargon <laughs> that we use in the development policy sector, also in Brussels. But what it means is that all EU policies, so all EU policies, even domestic EU policies, um, should be coherent with the EU's development objectives and development policy. Um, so, for example, um, what is uh, so for example eu policies on agriculture or or trade or migration should not have negative impacts or contradict uh the eu's development policy and and finally in the three pillars we look at financing and funding for sustainable development issues like oda overseas development aid how much uh, are, are, is the EU and its member states offering? Are they meeting their international commitments? What other kinds of financing is there? And are they, are they appropriate for sustainable development? And is there sufficient funding and financing for the role of civil society and, um, and the other objectives um, that Concord has? Finally, on the cross-cutting issues we work on, they are gender equality, we, and I'll talk about that actually quite a bit more in a, in a moment. Regional alliances, so that means, you know, what is the EU's approach to um, to Africa, Latin America, Asia, other parts of the world. Global citizenship education, and that's really looking at um, outreach to European citizens on, on development uh, policy and issues. Um, the private sector is an important cross-cutting issue because the private sector is um, is a key actor in development, and also, and then civil society power. And even though it's number it's the fifth one in the list, it's not the least at all. It's 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 a key priority that we integrate throughout all of our pillars, um, both because we represent civil society power, as I'll, I'll demonstrate uh, later in the in the talk but also um, because it is something that we need to consistently integrate um, because, um, because while civil society has power, globally, the space for civil society is shrinking. Now, I want to move in to look at what it is exactly we are trying to influence as civil society. I've given you a bit of some of the hints um, just by talking about the mandates and the objectives of, of the two organizations I represent. But, um, but I want to start with looking at some of the main development policies. Um, I, there are many development policies, so I'm, I'm touching here on some of the the kind of key frameworks and just to give you a, a, a hint of some of the areas that we work on. First thing to know is that what we, we're trying to influence or hold the EU to account to their own policies. So we're, yeah, we're trying to either influence the development of new policies or make sure the EU meets its commitments that are already in, in many areas very strong. And first and foremost is the Lisbon Treaty of the EU, which, um, which designates the EU's primary objective in development is poverty reduction. And, and that's critical um, because it means that any other objective in poverty reduction, uh, sorry, in development cooperation um, could be um, contrary to the, the the actual treaty and 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 so we we look very carefully about how development funds and ODA are used uh, to make sure that they are not instrumentalized for other purposes um secondly is a very important framework which is the EU consensus on development it is the the key development policy at the moment and it's it's the overarching EU frame um Thirdly, the EU has um, geographical policies and partnerships, which are critical to its relations with other countries and also set the, the development cooperation kind of partnership agreements, if you will, with other parts of the world. Those include the EU-Africa partnership. Also, what is called the Cotonou Agreement, which is an agreement between the EU and a set of countries called Africa, Caribbean and Pacific uh, countries. And that the, those both of those frameworks are the, the EU Africa Partnership and the Cotonou Agreement are being uh, renegotiated um, at, at the moment. 
and they, those will set the frame for the future EU relations with these parts of the world. But there, I've mentioned earlier, there are others as well. There's an uh, EU Latin America agreement, and then there are other types of agreements with other parts of the world. Um, so we definitely look at these geographic policies. We also, as civil society, look at sector specific policies. And, and in many sectors, there are also action plans. Um, one, again, which I will talk about a bit more as an example is the EU gender action plan. But there are others. There's a nutrition action plan. There's action plans on all sorts of uh, sector and policies. Um, and, and again, the society does really track them and seek to influence them, especially when they are both when they are being developed, but also um, to make sure to hold you to account in, in their implementation. Another um, point that we are very engaged in um, is the so called EU multi annual financial framework. Um, which is actually, I don't know how familiar you are with this. It's basically the EU budget frame. And as many of you might know, um, just this week, the EU, um, so the Council and the Parliament just came to an agreement on the EU financial, multi annual financial framework, which you call also the MFF. And what this is, is the overall financial framework for a seven year period. And in, in this case, um, it's been agreed for 2021 to 2027. And in our case, as civil society working in development, we are very um, keen, of course, to see um, to influence the allocations to for external action and development aid, as well as humanitarian aid. Um, but also, we we linked to the over kind of the next step in terms of there's the overarching agreement, but also the specific programming, how that you will actually specifically program the, the use of those funds. So those are areas which are very engaged in. And finally, of course, as you can imagine, we also are looking at the EU's um, implementation of its international commitments, um, the sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement on, on climate, um, UN Security Council resolutions. That's what UNSCR uh, means. Um, for example, 1325, which is um, the, the UN Security Council resolution on um, uh, women, peace and security. And, and in all of these areas, the EU has policies and commitments, but the question for us always is, are they being implemented and how are they being implemented? So I'm going to move on if I can. Oops, sorry, to... Okay, so more specifically, what CARE is trying to influence, just to give you a flavor. At CARE, we're, we've been looking at the, the MFF, so this overall budget, very important. A key priority for us has been the Gender Action Plan. I've mentioned it earlier, but the, in, um, the EU um, has an action plan for um, achieving gender equality through its external action. And, and currently, um, the EU is in its Gender Action Plan 2. But we have been working very um, intensively over the last two years with EU institutions on um, their development of the Gender Action Plan 3, which will cover the period from 2021 to 2024. And the EU is about to publish this new policy uh, this month. We believe it will be on the 24th of November. So um, we're very excited to see what will come out of that. And I will, again, talk about that a bit more later. Um, as a specific case study. Another area we've been working on as care is the EU style health strategy. It's under development, a new strategy for interaction with that important region. We've also been looking at the EU strategy on Yemen. This is just to give you a bit of a flavor of what we do uh, and what, what I do in, in my work, but also uh, civil society. We also work very uh, closely also in, in alliances with others on EU's climate commitments. Um, and currently the EU has been working on the climate law uh, and also on a new climate adaptation strategy. Um, and finally, we've already started working um, with EU interlocutors on their position for next year's World Food Systems Summit. At Concord, Concord is a very big uh, organization, so it's uh, it's vast <laughs> what we're working on. Um, I want to give you a bit of a sense also what Concord's doing. 
And I've mentioned already that we work on our three pillars are the inequalities and sustainable economy, policy coherence for sustainable development and funding. But to give you a better sense of what it is we're working on, um, on the inequalities and sustainable economy, we're looking at really a big shift. We actually are looking to try to influence a, a, a structural shift in the entire paradigm of the EU's approach to poverty reduction um, in order to address inequalities and human well-being. And to really look at, you know, is, is GDP the best measure of, of, of progress, for example, um, or are there other ways to measure um, human well-being and, um, you know, really to move away from a growth uh, mentality to towards a well-being um, approach, which is, as you can imagine, a huge, um, it's a heavy lift because um, it's going to be a long time before we are able to make those, uh, hopefully make those changes and shift, shift that entire mindset. But that's something that we strongly believe in and we're working towards. On policy coherence for sustainable development, we can't focus on every policy area. So we've decided to focus on two. One is on migration and trade. So again, to make sure that the, uh, the EU's uh, policies in, the area, in these areas do not have a negative impact, and in fact, ideally contribute positively to sustainable development. And then funding for sustainable development, I've already mentioned a number of times the EU budget, which is critical in every policy area, I have to say, not just in development. Um, but also, we're looking at not just the the, the 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 quantity of aid, but also the quality of aid, whether the aid how it, how it's being used it, it respects development effectiveness principles. What is the role um, of CSOs, so civil society organisations, um, in in the implementation of of the aid, um, and and how the EU works with civil society both in the EU and uh, at local level um, um, in its programming. Again, there's Concord, I mentioned there's these cross-cutting issues. Um, I think I've already um, touched on them also. I don't want to go into much detail here. The gender action plan keeps coming up because it's a critical one. The different EU Africa partnership, the African Caribbean and Pacific countries uh, partnerships, the, the EU and the Latin American and Caribbean countries, those types of partnerships we're really focusing on. Um, on, on the private sector, what's really interesting and coming up in the next uh, period is that the EU is, um, is seriously talking about um, introducing human rights due diligence uh, for the private sector, meaning that there would be human rights criteria um, for the, the private sector's work, which would be a massive, um, a massive achievement. And, and the civil society, we've actually been working on that for years. But we're, we're also making progress and we're seeing that next year the EU has already committed to introducing some sort of policy in this area. So it's something that we have a very close eye on, but also we bring our expertise to that uh, those discussions. And now, I want to move on. I've talked a, a bit about the, the what, and now look at some of the how we seek to influence civil society uh, as civil society. Um, I'm sure all of you know from your studies um, what, what are the key actors at EU level, but just as a reminder, <laughs> as an oversight, we have um, the Council of the European Union, which really for us, we kind of put it in a big package of these are the member states, we have to influence the member states. And so it goes beyond just the work that we have to do in Brussels, but we also have to work on the member states throughout uh, the EU. We have the European Parliament, the European Commission, and in our sector, of course, as well, the European External Action Service, which kind of sits between the Commission and the, and the member states, but um, does have an important role in interactions with partner countries. So these are our actors. The main ones, um, more specifically, in terms of the Commission, um, the, as you know, the Commission has right of initiative, so they're very important for us. And our main interlocutors, in fact, are DG DEFCO, so the Director General for Development Cooperation, which, by the way, we've learned will change its name in January to the D Director General for International Partnerships. But it's, it will be the same, same people, but different name, slightly different structure. And that is led by Mr. Kundun, so who's the, the gentleman in this photo. And then we have the Commissioner um, for International Partnerships, 
um, Commissioner Oberleinen and, and her cabinet, and she's the, the, the woman here uh, that you see. But we don't only work with the leadership, we actually work to influence European Commission um, and DEVCO, I should say, uh, staff at, at all levels. And again, in a, in a moment, I'll talk about tactics. And the Council, as you know, is quite complicated and that we have many different levels to work in in the Council. Um, it, in terms of the Council representation, <laughs> and, oh, oh, that was interesting. <laughs> Um, in terms of the council representation in Brussels, I mean, there's the European Council, which is the heads of state and the meetings of the heads of state. We also have the Council of the EU, as you probably all know, which is where the, the different ministers of each of the member states meet around their, their sectoral areas. So there is um, a development council, uh, which focuses, which brings together development ministers focusing on international development. Uh, but there's also Foreign Affairs um, Council, which is the main one that treats uh, also many of our issues. Um, Co-repair are the different ambassadors of all of the EU uh, member states in Brussels, and they also have a group which is very influential. But one of the, the kind of main technical um, council group that we work with are the working parties and committees. And in our case, it's the Council Working Party on Development Cooperation, the so-called CODEV. Um, but I should mention, as I said again, member states are critical. These are these are bodies that we influence in Brussels. But as Concord, we have the, and and also as CARE, I should say. But as Concord, we have the advantage of having platforms in all of the EU member states, so we can also influence the deliberations and policies towards the EU as they are devised at, at member state level. The Parliament uh, is a critical actor. Um, th their main power, as you probably know, is, is that they have an equal say to the Council in budgets. So it's been a very, very important time in working with them. Um, but we, we work with them on all different policy areas. And um, as you know, they gather in political groups. So we, as, as apolitical actors, actually, um, the civil society, we do reach out to different political groups. And the parliament is divided into different committees and delegations. For us, the key committees are the development committee and the foreign affairs committees. Unfortunately, though, the parliament is not um, a key EU actor on foreign affairs. They've relatively limited powers in these areas. But where we work with them most and where we can have a lot of impact is that they, they ask um, questions to the commission. Um, and that's a really important uh, um, avenue for us to influence the Commission through parliamentary questions and supportive parliamentary um, uh, members of European Parliament. Their reports, that the reports that they generate are, can also serve as an important guide and counterweight to um, Council positions and European Commission. So they still are, they are an important um, a very important actor and tend to work very closely with civil society. Also because civil society, um, as civil society, we're, we're closely connected as well to citizens and, and to the voters. Um, so it's it's quite an interesting dynamic and, and they're, they're, they play a key role as well in this, this um, work. Now I want to talk a bit about influencing tactics. Um, for us, it really depends on the, the issue or the context, which tactic we, we decide to use as civil society. But I want to give you an example of some of the tactics we use. Um, sometimes as civil society, we do very, we do very public or activist um, uh, tactics. They can be um, what we call stunts. So um, where we do kind of a, um, uh, I don't know the word in English, like a, it, so it can be theater or, or a big, you know, um, something very visible in front of the parliament or in front of the commission um, a main building called the Berlin Mall. Um, or this could also be mass, mass marches. This is what we'd consider the more activist approach. We also, though, um, organize very more technical events that we call policy events or roundtables, webinars, where we can really talk with policy experts to try to influence those experts along the way. We also have a tactic of very private uh, discussions. I mean, not everything we do is public or, or you know, tweeted. Um, 
Oh, we often, I've mentioned before that we're work, we work on the Sahel and Yemen as care international, for example. And by the way, we also work on pretty much every other crisis in the world. And in those very sensitive contexts, we cannot do public work. We have to um, try to influence policymakers in what we call in closed door private uh, advocacy, where we, where we talk about the real issues on the ground um, in a private way. Um, to seeking to influence those stakeholders, but without making a big, um, a, 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 a big um, uh, communication around that in order to protect often the people that we're working with when we work on very sensitive um, human rights or, or, or um, governance issues. We also bring local partners to tell their stories and share experiences uh, at EU level. So it's really important for policymakers, as you can imagine, to actually hear stories from people who are actually working in the countries affected by their policies. Um, so that's something that we really, um, it's a tactic we use um, when we need to kind of bring a more, uh, a, both a practical, but also an emotional um, link to an issue. We work with media. Um, that's that that can be linked to the very public stance, but sometimes we bring you know op eds, um, so editorials or or, or articles, um, and to bring our opinions out um, uh, to the media. And there's also very there's there's the media in member states, but there's also very kind of Brussels specific media which we we sometimes use um, specifically to uh, influence um, uh, policymakers in Brussels. We also send leaders, um, so we send letters to high level stakeholders, so the leaders, to commissioners, to director generals. Um, they, they, there's an obligation um, for the commissioners to actually respond to the letters they receive. So, um, so even, even though, um, you know, we might not see we not, might not always see a direct impact of those letters in terms of specific action. Um, they're an important tool for us to get an agenda on the table and to ensure that that the commissioner uh, or high level policymaker um, knows that civil society is watching. <laughs> civil society is watching what they're doing and, 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 and concerned. Um, it is, it's an important tactic. Another thing we do is we produce studies and reports. We, we provide evidence, analysis, uh, expertise um, to policymakers. Um, and and many, policy, many policies at EU level and many policymakers are heavily influenced by um, the, the expertise and practice we can bring from, from the ground. Finally, a really important issue is that we, we build champions, we build cohorts of champions. We build, um, we know who's our supporters in the parliament. Uh, we know who we can call on in member states to support specific issues, and we work with them to, to drive an agenda forward. I'm trying to change. Oops. Um, so uh, one another tactic, as you can imagine, is that we work in coalitions. Just Concord itself is a coalition, but Concord works also in coalition with other coalitions. Um, Care International, which is a network itself. We are part of Concord. We're also members of Voice, which is a, a coalition of a, a network of, organ, of humanitarian organizations. We're members of um, the Climate Action Network Europe. Um, we're also um, members of Crisis Action, and often these networks work together um, to to bring a kind of a shared perspective from civil society to European policymakers. Now, I want to provide a few examples, a kind of a case studies of, of where we've been able to influence uh, European agendas as civil society. And this is an example from CARE International. Our objective was to ensure a very strong European Union strategy and action plan on women, peace and security. Um, and then we also wanted to see a concrete implementation of this strategy and action plan in actual situations of crisis and peace processes. And the first thing we did was as civil society, we as CARE, we got a space on the European Union informal task force on women, peace and security. This was a task force that it was, um, was chaired by the 
um, European External Action Service and, and primarily included experts from European member states. So we were one of the few NGOs that sat on that task force um, to bring uh, expertise from, um, from civil society, but mostly from partner countries, because we, we work in over 100 countries and have a lot of specific experience, which we were able to share. But it was um, already a very big opportunity for us to be on the task force, because through our role there, um, we were able to influence the actual text of the, the strategy and action plan. So that was kind of part one of our of our approach. The second part of the approach was that we we organized with the Dutch ambassador to the Policy and Security Committee of the EU, a briefing for EU member state decision makers um, on Yemen and on women, peace and security in Yemen. And to do that, we brought four Yemeni women from, um, from, from Yemen, which in itself was very difficult to get them visas and to, to bring them to travel, to get them out of the war war zone. We brought them to Brussels. Um, uh, you can see here's a picture of, uh, of our some of them from um, there's there's four Yemeni women plus um, a young man youth activist who are all peace activists. And we brought them to brief ambassadors. Um, and it's it's amazing. I mean, um, the feedback from ambassadors was very strong because they it's the first time they actually heard from Yemeni women and youth working on peace inside Yemen, what their challenges are and what they want the EU to do. Um, and the, this delegation of Yemenis also met with the, the European ambassador on uh, women, peace and security, and also the European Commission. But essentially the impact of these different uh, approaches is, firstly, we, we influence the text of uh, and we actually ha we actually wrote parts of the text of the Euro the European Union Women and Peace and Security Strategy and the Action Plan, but also we really raised the importance of uh, of including Yemeni uh, grassroots women's organizations and youth organizations uh, working on peace building um, in the peace uh, processes on Yemen. And um, and since then, we've had um, feedback that um, that the EU has pushed for the inclusion of grassroots voices and women's voices um, in the actual peace processes, which are still underway. So for us, that was a, an important win. Another example is I wanted to share is Concord's a work on the gender action plan. I mentioned there's a current gender action plan, but a new one is actually being developed for. Um, which will be adopted later this month. And this has been a multi-year process. We, we worked both on um, tracking the implementation of the current gender action plan, and also using that work to influence the next gender action plan. So how we worked? Well, um, we worked through alliances, firstly. Um, this is, this is uh, Concord's work, but CARE actually, as CARE, we co-lead um, the work on the gender action plan on behalf of Concord. Um, and we do this with NGOs from across Europe to conduct joint analysis, um, gather evidence, create reports. So here you can see a photo of a report that we created. Um, we, we drafted a, a few, a couple of years ago, which was to look at the impact of the current gender action plan on women in developing countries or in, in the program countries. And the, the, the idea behind the report was to gather evidence around what is working and not working in the current EU gender action plan in order to influence the development and improve upon it for the next EU uh, gender action plan. We also work with the European Commission very closely with the um, with the policy units that are working uh, de devising the gender action plan, but also not just the gender team. We work with EU delegations. We work with geographic desks to make sure that they are implementing the gender action plan um, and taking it into account. And of course, we also work with DEFCO leadership and the commissioner to make sure there's a an overall drive uh, at the highest level to ensure that the gender action plan is, is implemented um, and that they take on board our recommendations for the next gender action plan. 
Um, in addition, we work with the council and member states. Um, we regularly have been briefing um, the, the council working party on development cooperation, um, as well as um, briefing um, member state experts in member state capitals. And we work with the parliament um, on awareness raising, but also uh, most recently provided extensive um, inputs into a parliament report on gender and external action. And the impact is, um, we, we know there's a new gender action plan coming up in um, this month, but we've actually been able to see an advanced draft of this uh, new policy uh, document. And it's, it's very strong. Um, it includes all of our key asks, um, even from the, the, the evidence that we brought in this report that I, I have on this slide, um, that photo on the slide. Um, we're also working to influence the council conclusion. So a communication is a, a commission document. And, um, and in addition to communication, um, we're, we're seeking to have a, a strong council commitment uh, on the gender action plan. Um, so that's still coming up, but um, we, we're hopeful that will have a strong impact. I know I'm running out of time, so I want to move on. This one, I want to just very quickly say, we've also been very carefully working with on, on the EU's commitments on climate change. And our main objective is to ensure that the EU's, um, EU implements its Paris commitments from 2015, and especially the commitments to reduce global, more, global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade. And here you can see in this photo, I just um, wanted to share this because we, one of our tactics was to, uh, uh, um, to, um, to dress as Eiffel Tower <laughs> um, and, and, um, and to get pictures with, with policymakers to get them to, to, to express their commitments. And here we have actually um, a photo of, that's a colleague of mine dressed as the Eiffel Tower next to the prime minister of Belgium, who's holding a little, sign saying, you know, expressing commitment to, to the Paris uh, agreement. So, I mean, that's a little bit more of a public stunt because then we can tweet the photos and we do things around it. But, um, you know, that's just one of the, the, the little uh, initiatives we did on, on advocacy. But most of our initiatives are much more um, evidence-based, scientific. I mean, a whole range of types of initiatives, but years of advocacy on these issues, I think are finally paying off because the EU um, is finally really committing to climate action. Uh, the EC announced a commitment to 55% reduction in carbon emissions. The European Parliament lifted that to 60%, and we're expecting a decision from the Council by the end of December. And the Council is the more difficult one because member states are not very keen to commit to um, climate action in some, in some cases because it's difficult to, to implement. Um, but they've already committed to higher than their current 40% uh, commitments, which means we are making progress. Um, and it feels like a real victory for civil society um, because we've been working on it for years. But as you know, there's also been mass movements across Europe uh, on uh, climate action. And it's really something that, you know, we've been working on on a technical level, but it's kind of gained a lot of traction. Um, yeah. So I did actually stop sharing. I'm going to, oops, sorry. Uh, that's, I want to stop sharing. And now uh, I'm going to enter into the last bit of my presentation, but without, I want to do this without the slides. Um, because what all of this that I've been presenting to you is really to, dem what I wanted to demonstrate is that civil society has power. Um, especially when we're working in alliances, but we we really can sh we can change EU policy and mindsets, and it's actually a very exciting place to be in. Um, we have power uh, in our sector because of the number of supporters that we have across the EU. Um, Concord has two thousand six hundred organisations, but each one of those are supported by by members of the, the general public. A lot of our funding from civil society comes from individuals who want to change, who want to make a change, who want to contribute to greater good and a better society. 
Um, and that's that's really um, kind of an exciting thing to to be part of and to represent. Um, civil society also has power in our sector due to um, the innovations that we bring. I, I haven't been able to talk in depth about everything we do, but a lot of our programs in 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 countries across the world um, bring a lot of um, innovative uh, uh, innovative approaches that we also then bring to policymakers to try to influence um, how they work. And, and we bring evidence and experience. We bring real experience from the ground. Um, um, I, you know, I'm based in Brussels, but I, uh, my, my colleagues are based, you know, I have 10,000 colleagues based all across the world um, whose experience I can draw on um, to, to influence EU policymakers. So the technical expertise we can bring um, is very important. Civil society hold policymakers to account um, and we connect them with new ideas, approaches, innovations um, based on the support from, of, of millions of people. We have a real added value in that um, we have a global reach um, and, and we can complement also um, local expertise. Um, but we also have challenges. I, did, I didn't want to say that it's not all for Ozi. Um, we have, we definitely have uh, made progress on a number of policy areas, but we have challenges both in ter in policy areas, but also in terms of, um, you know, the, the nature of our, our structures and, and how we work. Um, some of the key policy challenges are, um, are the evolving, uh, one is the evolving policy approach towards um, new international partnerships. So uh, I've already mentioned that the Director General of the of the European Commission, which we currently call Director General uh, for Development Cooperation, will be changing its name to the Director General for International Partnerships. And the Commissioner for this area is also called the Commissioner for International Partnerships. And in itself, it's not a bad thing. But when we look at the detail, we see that the EU in this approach is moving increasingly away, actually, from a focus on poverty reduction and, um, and the core objectives um, of development, um, reaching the sustainable development um, goals. We're seeing a real shift to more what we call an interest-based approach. So focused more on EU domestic interests than on, on the actual objectives of EU development policy. So we're, there's a whole rhetoric around the, the international partnerships, which is that, you know, we want to, as the EU, would like to, to work in better partnership with partner countries. But when looking at some of the details, we're seeing that the EU is actually trying to, in some cases, impose its own priorities and its own interests on other countries. So it's something we're looking at very closely and that concerns us. It's a big challenge. Another big challenge we face is the shrinking CSO space, so shrinking space for civil society to work both in the European Union and globally. Um, I've been, I mentioned I've been working in Brussels for 14 years. I've seen um, a real shift in these, in these years um, to, to much less consultation with civil society on behalf of the European institutions, much less space for us to actually engage on specific policies. I mean, I've given you a few examples of successes, but there are many examples of failures where, where civil society, we've had no impact on policies uh, because the doors are entirely closed to us. And we see this as a really big danger, um, um, uh, you know, a risk, um, both for our own work, but also, you know, in terms of the democratic space in the EU. So it is a big challenge for us and one that we're constantly pushing back on. Um, another challenge is just our relevance. I mean, we need to ensure as civil society that we maintain our relevance. Um, and, and, and in that sense, are we, are we following the agenda? Are we just running behind the, the EU policy and trying to um, damage control, make sure that it's not that bad? Um, or are we driving and setting the agenda? In some cases, I'd say we are, but it's a real challenge to us to make sure that that um, that we can be agenda setters and not just kind of following behind, um, um, and 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 uh, where you know not being really relevant and just kind of um, um, trying to to um, 
chase chase behind. Um, I don't know exactly how to express this very well. If if we're not driving an agenda, then then we're actually not that relevant. We're just kind of just, you know, um, constantly reactive and playing catch up. Another is a danger that we could be co-opted or actually become institutionalized ourselves. This is a real danger. I mean, care is a, for example, is a massive, and we're a very big NGO. Are we challenging the system or are we too much a part of the system? Um, that's really important, especially when we're looking at issues such as um, challenging the neocolonialist um, uh, and racist, uh, neoliberal, uh, approaches that that we've been we are trying to challenge, but actually, are we are we just part of those? And it's something we constantly have to be asking ourselves, and we have to be very very um, cognizant of of that risk um, that we're not just another part of the system. And another, just finally, it's just really a challenge for us to actually achieve achieve impact in a current climate. Which is, um, well, you know, there are some major areas of progress, like on gender and climate. There are also major uh, obstacles um, in in the form of very, you know, right wing and reactive uh, policies. So, in conclusion, I'd like to say, as a sector, um, what we need to do is um, to to address these challenges. We we seek to engage, innovate, challenge. And evolve, and that's those are that's really what um, Concord is focusing on, um, in in how we do and what we do. We need to continue to engage with our supporters across the EU, but also um, our our, um, our stakeholders in third countries. We also need to innovate. We need to disrupt the system, but also constantly look at our own ways of working and challenge ourselves to use different tools, different ways to get our messages across in order to, to, to influence. Um, we need to challenge the system, uh, challenge society ourselves and evolve. We need to be agile, flexible, um, look at our successes, but also um, carefully look at our failures, analyze uh, where we've gone done well, where we've gone wrong. And, um, and and analyze trends so that we can listen and adjust and, and be ahead of the game rather than chasing behind. Um, but overall, I can say that CSO, I mean, there's so much for us to be optimistic about and, and excited about. We make, we have influence change and we continue to influence change. Gender action plan, climate, systemic change, we are seeing change. Um, which is so exciting, meeting SDGs and ensuring, ensuring social justice and tackling all forms of inequality. This is our role and we we embrace it, but we also need to continue because if we're not saying these things as civil society, and I'm talking about civil society working in development cooperation, but actually right now, um, I also mean civil society in all forms. I mean, there's, we are organized civil society, but there's also citizens, citizens' voices. Um, we need to transform society to make Europe um, and the world into the one that we would like it to be, um, to transform society to one that, that values human well-being above economic growth um, and, and equality of all kinds. We can, as civil society, we have the power to influence EU development policy and impact millions of lives. And, and just the last thing I'd like to say is that I believe we play a critical role in the functioning of the EU as a democracy. So, um, yes, I'm, I've finished and indeed, um, I would like to ask everyone now, to raise hands or to enter any questions or comments you may have in the chat. But I certainly welcome you if you'd like to speak, to please don't be shy and go ahead. I'm very <laughs> interested to hear what you all have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Celine. Thank you very much. So you can um, uh, you can understand, uh, dear students, uh, how uh, networking is a key word in Brussels. In Brussels, uh, is uh, absolutely. So, uh, 
so and it, it is important for you because uh, for for your future if you want to work uh, of course in brussels and so on so uh, and network it is not easy it's not easy it's a difficult task of course uh, so um so i have many questions i would start just uh, with uh, one of them uh, which has to do uh, with the, the cotonou agreements uh, so just that you mentioned before that is uh, um now the um, and on the renegotiation of cotonou agreements that is uh, um that is our um um, is civil society, are civil society organizations involved in these negotiations? Uh, how and uh, with particular reference to Concord? And uh, um, what do you think about uh, how the negotiations are going on? And what are your priorities uh, to this uh, in this respect? Thank you very much. Yes, I think that uh, if you, the, the, yes, the best strategy is to, to you know, to answer what I want. That is, okay. yeah. mm. That's fine. I was waiting to see if there was any other questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer this. I'm, I will just provide the caveat that I'm not personally a very um, big expert on cartoon. I, I have expertise, but I haven't been, I'm not the one who's been leading this effort. That, be, that being said, um, I've been involved in it to an extent, so I will give you my knowledge to what to what I know today. Uh, but um, I would certainly have colleagues who would be um, better placed to provide you with uh, the analysis um, of, of of where we are today. But what I can say, firstly, on the Cotonou Agreement is that it's been a huge struggle um, to to create any space for civil society involvement. Um, in these negotiations. And in fact, we have not had any formal role in this involvement. And we have been demanding as Concord and as civil society a role, um, both, both, sorry, I should say both as European civil society, but also demanding that um, civil society from the ACB states also have an opportunity to contribute um, to, to the discussions and negotiations. And that space has not been made. Um, I've been in some quite shocking discussions with um, representatives, I should say, from the, 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 the there's an organization called the African Pacific and Caribbean um, States Organization, which is the represent, that is the counterpart in the negotiations um, with the EU. And, and I've had some shocking discussions where, where um, leaders from the, th that um, organization have, have outright said, we not only do we not see a role for civil society, we do not want civil society to be part of this. They just complain. <laughs> um, so it, it, it shows that there's a long way in terms of, of work to, to um, create civil society space. So I can say some of our main demands. So we've engaged in this not as part of um, formally as part of the negotiations, but Concord has been working with civil society from these regions to develop joint positions that we share with the um, negotiators. So unfortunately, we don't have a seat at the table, but we were trying to make that space. And some of our, our main our main demands have been around um, the need for um, civil society space, both in these negotiations, but just more generally, um, because there's um, it's it's a real struggle for civil society, um, especially in many of these countries to to um, to um, to work on in the same. I mean, I've given you a lot of examples of how we work with EU um, as civil society and how we've been able to affect change. Um, even though I, I do see a shrinking of civil society space in the EU, it's much, much more challenging for our counterparts in other parts of the world. So that's kind of one, one ask. But our main asks are around ensuring that, that the priorities that are agreed are the priorities of the people of these countries and not um, the priorities of either the EU internal priorities or priorities of, um, of the of of potentially non-democratic elites from some of these countries. So it's it's a bit sensitive, as you can imagine, to raise these issues. I'm being very frank with all of you. Um, I can tell you the way we 
express what I've just shared with you is much more diplomatic <laughs> and, um, and, and careful. But the main gist of it is that we, we want to see really democratically developed priorities that meet the needs of the people and that, um, that, that really work towards sustainable developments um, and, and the international commitments of, of the sustainable development goals of Paris Agreement, all of that. So those are kind of the main asks, I mean, in a nutshell. Um, yeah, and, and to ensure that really it's a lot of the countries in the ACP regions are, are fragile countries um, where, where good governance um, is, is largely lacking. So again, the, the role of civil society is even more important there, which is why we push so hard for it. Um, yeah. yeah. There is a question from Tiziana who likes yeah. to take the mic. So please, uh, please go Tiziana and pose your question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I was wondering if you could give uh, um, your perspective on the topic of gender equality and the way the EU is working towards it. Because I know it's a very uh, complex issue and not all uh, um, shades, uh, let's say, of gender equality or aspects of gender equality are uh, um, given the same uh, relevance in the discourse or say, are, are uh, you know, accepted as something to strive for in the same way. So I would like your perspective on that. Thanks. Okay, Celine, please. Okay. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. I mean, this is something I have been, I'm, I'm apart from my role in Concord and care, I'm also personally um, very committed to this, this issue. And even outside of my work, I've been working on this um, as a feminist activist. So I can just say this is something that's very close to, to my heart. Um, and also, um, it's 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 been a long struggle but i can say over the last 10 years we've seen a huge huge progress in this area so when i first arrived in brussels um, 14 years ago there was no gender equality policy or action plan or, or anything um at eu level um and now as you may know um in march the eu developed its very first ever EU-wide gender equality strategy. Um, in addition to that, we have what I've mentioned a few times, the Gender Action Plan for External Action. So I have to say the gender equality strategy was a huge, huge, huge uh, victory for so many feminists and gender equality uh, activists across the EU because um, we, we didn't have it before. It was just entirely missing. Um, but um, I agree that from, you know, there's still a lot of progress to be made at EU level and at EU level in its work internationally. So, yeah, we've come a long way, but we still have a way to go. Um, in the external action domain, um, the, the big innovations, and I say big progress that I believe we are making in, um, <laughs> that I believe we're making in, um, uh, the action plan is that until now, the gender action plan, even though it's called an action plan, it's been qu still quite theoretical and quite um, quite focused on um, indicators related to processes. So the indicators of success were around, you know, how many um, you know gender experts the EU were able to hire in their EU delegations, which is critical. But it's not enough. It's not telling us whether the gender action plan is actually having impact on women's lives and actually not just women's lives on the lives of of all genders. And that's, I think, the step change we're going to see in the next gender action plan. As I said, I've seen a, a an advanced uh, draft, uh, uh, which I believe is much more focused on impact on indicators for impact, but also looking beyond only, uh, um, I, I believe, only women's rights to a much more gender uh, equality focus. And we're seeing even the rhetoric at EU level is, is, is um, 
at least at the Brussels level, we're seeing much more rhetoric around support for LGBTI, so the lesbian, gay, transsexual, intersex, etc. community. We are seeing um, um, much more, we're seeing commitment to gender budgeting, so huge progress. That being said, and I see there's a question also and a, a comment in the in in the in the chat. Um, there are also parts of the EU that are that are taking steps back. I mean, yes, Poland and and um, sexual reproductive health and rights, um, particularly on, on abortion law, is is one case in point. Um, so that's why um, those of us working on gender equality, um, we don't take it for granted. Because we are seeing progress, but we also have very strong reactive elements. And one of the, the biggest um, hot potatoes in this area, or the biggest you know, uh, uh, challenging parts of the gender equality agenda is, is um, sexual reproductive health and rights and abortion rights. And in fact, it's such a sensitive issue that we try um, not to um, to to present any new policies related to SRHR um, at EU level because they've already because the past policies are relatively strong and any time we bring SRHR to the to a policy dialogue at EU level, the risk is to roll back our progress. So we try to rest on what we already have and 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 build on that. Um, but it's it's tremendous um, struggle. The, the risk is 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 absolutely to um, to fall back and and there's a question about you know how care and Concord reacted um, about the change um, in 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 abortion law in Poland if we plan to take a stance with EU institution interlocutors um, I can say that at care we we gave it a lot of thought care does not have a a member in Poland and our Poland is not one of the countries where we have a, um, a formal presence of any kind or um, or a um, an operating um, um, uh, partnership. So we we thought about it carefully and decided as care that we were not best placed to take direct action on this issue, but to be more behind the scenes um, supporting others. So you know we helped partners you know tweet on the issue we um we we asked our members um and members colleagues um to to be supportive in the in the global and um, um social media space but we did not take this up as our own issue towards interlocutors because it's also very important in in a network space to be very clear of where your legitimacy is and where your best place to make that um to to take that action, Concord, um, Concord, I believe also did some tweeting, but also felt that because Concord is um, a network working again on development policy, that we were best placed to support, but not be um, in the driving seat. So it's always a, there's always a a very careful um, uh, reflection on on where we can best um, support efforts. But by all means, both Concord and Care were supportive of our sisters and 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 brothers uh, um, um, who were um, um, working um, to protest the, the laws. And it's something that we're constantly uh, raising that the EU ha has great commitments, uh, EU wide policy and externally, but we need to walk the talk within the EU as well. I hope that answered your question. I was trying to answer two at once, but the main thing is we still have progress made on abortion SHR. We know that there's a wage gap in the EU. We know that gender-based violence is still rampant, both in the EU and externally. We we know that there's still so much, and we know that gender, you know, is not just about women as well or not you know it's it's much broader so there's still a huge progress that we need to make and we can't let our guard down okay so selena there is a question from salvatore salvatore is your turn hello good morning good morning thank you for your lecture yes. i have a few questions and curiosities on the role of the european external action service 
in this field. I, I read a um, Concord recommendation in the occasion of the, um, of the European External Action Review in uh, 2015, where you asked for a major role of the European External Action Service in uh, assuring a kind of coherence uh, between the commitment of the treaties in the field of development policies and humanitarian aid and the actual policies of the Commission, first of all, and of the, of the Council. So I'm curious to know um, to what extent do you think the, the creation and institution of the European External Action Service has impacted on uh, um, the management of these policies, but also your work uh, uh, to influence these policies. And uh, finally, uh, if anyway, the major responsibility is really still on the hand of the Commission, and so to what extent the creation of this European External Action Service has changed a bit the, the shift of balance in the management of these policies. Thank you. Celine, please. Yes, thank you for that question. It's a very good question and it's a very, um, very complex issue. Um, because the the role of the because it's constantly evolving still. I mean, it's it's interesting. It's still a relatively new institution. Uh, the AS. I mean, in the in the scheme of things, it's about what about a decade old. And um and and we've seen a real um. It, it it's it's constantly evolving um in its role, and we can see each commission. So this is the third commission. Um where we've had the, the EAS and the role of um of 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 the, the high representative who's also vice president of, of the commission um has also been evolving and 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 I'd say in many ways um has been strengthening um the, the policy role of of the EAS. But the EAS has played also a very it, it does sit somewhere in between the commission and and the council. Um, so um, I I do believe that it has um, it it it's increasingly strengthening the the coherence of EU external policy. But it's taken it's been it's it's moving in that direction, but it's taking a long time. Um, to get there. That's kind of my really short answer. Um, I, I still believe that the, when it comes to foreign policy, the council still has the, is, is still the main driver. So, um, the EAS has strengthened the joint role and some of the coherence, um, um, of EU, po EU wide policies, but, um, Ultimately, member states are still driving um, foreign and development policy. I'm not sure if I'm, has that answered your question at all? Or do you would like to dig into a specific aspect of it? No, no, it's okay. Now, generally, I wanted to know anyway, if finally it, uh, as it, it has impacted your, uh, your work or uh, it is the same as it was before anyway, I don't know. Um, your work as Concord, as uh, um, as ONG organizations, if it is okay. uh, undermining or supporting the job, or if it as a voice anyway, or if it's uh, all in the hand of the Commission and the yes, as a really. Mm -hmm. role. They definitely have a have a role. The the AS definitely has a role, in and um, in many ways, um, it's probably a role that's not fully appreciated or recognized. But for example, I mentioned earlier how um, as civil society, we've been engaging significantly in the the issue of programming the next EU budget um, development cooperation um, um, instrument. It's actually called the Neighborhood and Development Cooperation, the, the DT, Neighborhood and International development cooperation instrument. Okay. And in fact, 
the the programming guidance for um for the EU delegations where who will be programming the majority of the funding is jointly is being jointly drafted by the uh, the EAS and DG Depco. So, and and we often see this. We're seeing increasingly um, joint communications of the EAS and Depco. They're 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 working very closely together. So, in fact, if we want to influence these processes, we have to work not only with Depco but also with the key people in the EAS. And I should mention, I I I think I talked about um, some work we did to influence the Women, Peace, and Security Strategy and Action Plan. The majority of our work there was with member state, with the EAS, which was driving that process, and member states. Um, so it shows that th there's there's actually quite a lot that um, of influence that the EAS has. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope that helped a bit. Yeah, uh, there is a question from Francesco. Francesco, please feel free to take the mic. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank you for the lecture. It was really interesting. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, um, in particular, the relationship between uh, Concord and Italy. As we know, Italy is a, a really is a really big uh, problem when it comes to uh, uh, the struggle with, uh, right, with human rights, especially for our uh, prison system and uh, inequality about gender and ethnicities. So I would like to ask, what what are the problems in working with Italy, and if there are, what are the positive shades of this? Celine, please. Well, that's a really good. <laughs> no, it's a good question. So, so, so they. <laughs> The real um, what's interesting with Concord, unlike, for example, care or, you know, care is a member of Concord, but Concord also has members from each of the member states that, that are NGO platforms. And in fact, Concord's Italian platform member is Concord Italia. So, um, so a lot of our interaction with Italy um, happens through the organized um, development um, uh, civil society um, uh, development NGOs uh, in Italy. So the good thing is that it's not somebody like myself who sits in Brussels who um, devises our outreach and strategy towards the Italian government, but in fact the Italian members of Concord who are advising us in Brussels and also taking our policy asks to the Italian government um, in, in Rome. So that's kind of one thing to know that our relationship is very much driven by our Italian, uh, our Italian members and, and, and our Italian members, I should say, know best how to frame the issues for the Italian, um, for the Italian, uh, government. But I, it's interesting you mentioned gender because Italy actually, interestingly, in our sector, in the development sector, Italy has not has actually been quite supportive on the gender issues. Not going to say they're the leader, but they're not they're not the main blocker, which is interesting. And um, and there's actually a lot of very strong gender expertise in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and and gen and and fantastic gender experts who contribute to the EU level dialogue. I think some of our biggest challenge with uh, in, in, on policy issues with Italy, I, I can say have been around a migration, um, which is understandable. It's a very it's a challenging issue for all of Europe, but understandable that it's particularly difficult um, in the Italian context. I'd say migration and also Italian policy towards towards Libya um, and some of the kind of the issues around around human rights um, and and approaches there. And 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 it's really difficult. It's really difficult. There's no doubt. Um, but we've been, as I said, working with our Italian um, members to 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 devise appropriate strategies to 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 reach out. 
Okay, so now time, yeah, uh, we ran out of, out of time already, but I have just a, la a last question uh, just in two, in two minutes or in two seconds. Uh, that is, uh, if, you, um, if you think that the openness of the European Union towards civil society is increasing or decreasing, because, uh, you know, there are uh, many, you know, uh, so many regional organizations, are so, so the space for uh, civil society involvement is narrowing, is narrowing uh, all over the world. So just to just a few words about Europe and the European Union and the trends. Thank you. I, I believe I can say in terms of the trends, I can speak from the, the perspective of, of civil society in my sector mm. and I. I can say in the development sector, the development cooperation sector, um, civil society space is definitely shrinking. Um, for the for the Commission in particular, um, the main interlocutors are no longer civil society. It, they are the private sector, the UN, which fair enough. I mean, fair enough that multilaterals are an important um, um, actor, but also really increasingly the um, the investment banks. And and there's a lot, a lot less space for civil society. In fact, in this re, um, reorganization of, of DG DEFCO, which is becoming DG International Partnerships, um, it, it will be very, I, I, I recommend when it happens in January to have a close look at the new structure, you'll see it's very much framed around managing investment partnerships, managing partners with multilaterals. There's um, there's one small unit on civil society where, I mean, civil society is really kind of being put into a little hole of, you know, like in a little box. And that's that it, 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 our, our space has shrunk, in, has shrunk significantly. So it's a big challenge um, and it's one that we're consistently being vocal about um, to because because if we don't speak about it, it will continue that the trend will continue in that direction and um and i know that i'm talking about from our set our, our perspective as a sector but in fact um the issues that that we work on as a sector as i've mentioned before are really driven by um by our supporters by activists who, who engage with us you know we we're very um um entrenched in a way in the in the in the kind of uh, different movements across the eu to to change the world i mean it sounds all a bit you know like this but that's what we're trying to do we're trying to create the world that we want um so it would be a pity if this trend were to um go much further and we're definitely trying to push back Thank you so much to all of you. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you to you. And uh, yeah, it has been uh, extremely interesting. And uh, so thank you for joining and for your time. And uh, yes, yeah, so as you can see there, there are messages on the chat confirming what I'm saying. So uh, thank you again. And uh, thank you to dear students for joining, of course. And uh, let's meet again on WebEx on Monday. Celine, thank you again. And uh, thank keep you in very and much. keep in touch and keep in touch. Absolutely. I wish mm -hmm. you all the very best with the rest of your course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.